for those who just joined us, we'll start uh, sharp 802. Okay, it's 802. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum's Thursday Talk Shop Series Season 3. Okay, so uh, thank you for joining us uh, late this evening today. So this program is going to be from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. And today it's going to be about natural history and bug type Pokemon with Fu Mao Sheng. So maybe Mao Sheng, you can just wait. Okay, all right, so before I start, uh, I mean, before I hand the time over to him, uh, let me just tell you a little bit more about the museum. So I hope you guys have visited us before. This is how we look like. We are this rock-shaped building located in the campus of the National University of Singapore. We used to be called the Raffles Museum of Biodiversity and Research, which some of you might be familiar with. So we do a lot of things at the museum. We uh, mainly work on Southeast Asian biodiversity and research. So these are just some pictures of our gallery. We are still open now. So if you haven't visited, please do come and visit us. Okay. So like what I mentioned, we work on uh, Southeast Asian research and education. So um, the next slide will actually show you some of the things that we do at the museum. So if you look at the top three photos, right? These are actually the uh, pictures of our collections. So we actually hold a lot of uh, animal and plant specimens. And we also do a lot of outreach and education program. So uh, I'm actually from the outreach and education unit. So we do a lot of indoor and outdoor programs for people of all ages. So without a further ado, I'm going to hand the time over to Fu Mao Sheng as well as Sean Yat. So both of them today will be talking a bit about natural history and bug-inspired Pokemon. So um, like what I said at the start, if you would like to ask questions, please go ahead and type it in the chat box. Uh, you can um, enter your questions anytime or uh, any point of time during the program, and we will answer the questions towards the end. So now I'll hand the time over to Mao Sheng. Okay, uh, then it's time to share my screen. Oh, all right. Okay, yeah, here we go. Okay, so uh, good evening to one and all. Okay, so to introduce myself, I am Mao Shen. I am one of the curators in the museum with a background in etymology. Uh, and because we are talking about Pokemon, so in terms of the game, right, I'm actually one of the bug catchers in the museum, right? Today's call itself is quite, quite big itself, so I hope everyone is doing well. Now, at the same time, uh, for those who may not know, right, this year is also the 25th anniversary of Pokemon. So that is why we have that uh, number 25 at the bottom right hand screen. Right? Pokemon actually first started out in 1996. Now, before we kickstart this uh, evening, uh, I think, yeah, like what uh, Ja has mentioned earlier, right, you may want to get yourself a bit ready to right, put in questions, right? Along the way, uh, as we go through the slides, right, there will be some questions that you all may want to think about also. Right? So it's something you know, like how you see Pokemon series about like who's that Pokemon, right? So let's see whether how knowledgeable you are to the Pokemon itself. Okay, so let's get started. Oops. Okay, so yes, I think most of you are actually, if not maybe all of you will be familiar with this particular item, right? What we call it the Pokédex, right? A device that actually is used in the Kanto region of the Pokemon world. Now, you all would know that the Pokédex main purpose is actually to document all the different kinds of Pokémon that uh, the trainers encountered, right? And it becomes a database that provides quick information and history about each Pokémon. Now, for those who are, may not be familiar, right, in the museum itself, we also have our own uh, Pokédex, right? It's the Biodiversity of Singapore Online. So if you want to visit our Singapore Pokédex, right, you can actually see in the link below. Right, so you can take a screenshot of it or so. And right, uh, it has a very similar objective, right? Document all the different species of animals and plants that we have in Singapore, right? And then in some cases itself, as you actually venture into the website, you get to see like, oh, how different animals and plants are actually related to each other. For example, like looking at the diet of the banded leaf <coughs> Excuse me. Right, so when you enter that website, uh, the, our Singapore Pokédex, right? This is actually what you see on the website. At this point in time, we have reached about 15k species that are documented in Singapore. Now, we are still in the process of building up this Pokédex, so the numbers will grow in due time, right? And we got to ask entomologists, right, for us bug catchers, right? We are still searching for new insects that can be discovered in Singapore, or maybe some insects to be rediscovered. Now, for all of us, right, we have watched movies, uh, cartoons, anime, we get to see creatures or even characters that are maybe half 
animal, half human, or in some cases, they are chimera. So the thing is, you know, when you look at all these creatures itself, right, or the characters, where do the artists or the creator get the ideas from to have that, uh, that creature or the character, right? So most of the time is that you're always based on the animals and plants that we have seen in real life, right? And not only just having to look at their morphology or how they look like, right? Sometimes they also include the biology as well. Now, for this evening, we are going to be looking at the origin of Pokemon, but um, because as an entomologist, we are going to focus on the bug types itself, right? So we will get to see, you know, which insect or even invertebrates that actually inspire the different Pokemon designs, right? Uh, in some cases, I'll use some of our local fauna, so that you know that when you go out into, let's say, the parks or your nature visa, you see an insect there itself, you can kind of see, hey, this is a bit familiar, like this particular animal is the one that inspires the creation of this particular Pokemon. Now, I will not be go through in, uh, going through all the Pokemon. And of course, they are really far too many, right? And at this point in time, we have about 807 different Pokemon, right? So we will only be touching on some of the popular ones, if not the familiar ones. Okay, so let's get this started. All right, so yes, there are different types of bug type Pokemon uh, in the Pokemon world itself, right? Now, so here's uh, my first mini quiz to all of you guys here online. Right. How many different bug type Pokemons are there inside the Pokemon series? Right. This includes up to the latest generation of Sword and Shield. So I'll give you about maybe five seconds to think about how many there are. I think you also would know that when you play Pokemon Go, so right, there's not really many. So the numbers itself, is it a triple digit or a single digit or even a double digit? Okay, I do see in the chat a little some people have answers that are very close and some are being very general. Okay, so here is the answer for you guys. So how many different bug type Pokemons are there? The answer is there are actually 84 different bug types itself. Okay, uh, this will also include those that are actually of secondary nature. Okay, now, but this is only comprised of maybe say about 9% of the different Pokemon. This is actually quite the opposite of our real world itself. You now, in the real world, Right. They are, we have at least 1 million species uh, being described for the insects compared to mammals, which could be only about a few thousand. Right. So there is actually a very big difference. Now, so let's get started with one of the first and most popular region in regards to the Pokemon world. And you want to recognize what map are you looking at or what region you're looking at here. And it could be quite familiar, right? Uh, yes, I do see some of them in the chat. So this is actually your Kanto region. Now, when you're inside the Kanto region itself, right, when you first started out your Pokemon journey, right, what is actually the first bug Pokemon that most people or all of you will actually encounter? <laughs> right, I do see the correct answers in the chat group as well. Right, basically, it's, yes, it is Caterpie. So when you look at Caterpie itself, right, which insect actually inspired the design of it? Right, this insect itself is actually uh, quite commonly found in Singapore too, especially when you have plants that are a uh, citrus plant, right? Uh, yes, it's actually the caterpillar of your lime swallowtail butterfly, right? This is actually one of the common insects we have around the world. So now, if you will actually look at the photo, you can see there's already a lot of similarities, right? The first one is the eye spot here, right? There's found on the caterpillar. Now, the purpose of the eye spot is actually a form of defense, right? Actually to deter your potential predators like your birds, right? It's like, you know, when the head is down, the caterpillar can tell, hey, I know the bird is there, but it's actually being misled, right? It's, not, it's only a false eye. But what about the circles on the caterpillar itself, right? Those are actually the reflection of spiracles of the caterpillar. You know, that is actually how your caterpillars breathe itself. So when your caterpillars mold, right, you actually you see them molding. You can actually see white stringy stuff that's actually coming out of those holes. Those are actually the breathing tubes, right? Now, last but not least, when you see caterpillar's mouth itself, this is actually the head of your actual caterpillar. So when caterpillar actually does a string shot, right, it's actually come up from, it's coming up in the same place where your caterpillar will actually produce the silk from its mouth. Okay, so we see, see three main parts here, but one last thing here that you all may have noticed is something very obvious. It's this one, right? So the last one is the pink appendage found in caterpillar, and we can actually find it in the caterpillar itself also. Right now, this one will only show when the caterpillar is actually being stirred, right? And not only is that it's being very bright red or reddish color, right? It also emits a foul smell to deter the predators when they actually was about to eat it. So you can start to see that you know 
your Pokemon and some of the real life insects are actually very similar. Okay, so we have a look at Caterpie. If you know Caterpie, you know, you will also know its evolution, right? You will evolve into Metapod, right? Now, when you talk about Metapod itself, hmm, what do we know about its biology? Now, for Metapod, now, while this shell itself is, uh, it tends to be very hard steel, right? You no, know, any powerful impacts will cause its uh, liquid inlets to pop up, right? Leaving it completely exposed. So if you were to watch the anime or this or the cartoon, right, you will tend to see you know, Metapod is always remain emotionless, right? Because it's actually rebuilding itself for evolution. Now, it's also very similar to the pupa or the chrysalis, right? In this stage, the inside of the caterpillar has actually been broken down, right? It becomes a soupy goo inside. And then the cells, what are they doing? They are actually rearranging themselves in order to form the butterfly. Okay, so yeah, that is caterpie and that's metaphor. Now, I guess you all know the final stage, right? And that brings us to the final evolution of the metamorphosis or the caterpillar, right? And in Pokemon, you get butterfly. But in the real world, for this particular species, you get the lime butterfly. But if you were to look closer, hmm, there's actually not much similarities between both of them, right? So lime butterfly may not be exactly the exact inspiration for creating butterfly. So what will it be? Uh, for me, I would say it's this particular butterfly here, right? So for butterfly, right, it has a bit more similarities to the lesser zebra butterfly, right? Uh, while this butterfly is not found in Singapore, but it's found in Thailand, right? Butterfly is based on one group of uh, butterflies called uh, Papel Leonidae, right? And lesser zebra is actually one of these butterflies. So now we already get to see three of the Pokemon and the insect inspired them. So let's see another bug Pokemon also found in Kanto region, very similar to Caterpie. And what is it? Something that's yellow. Yep. Okay. Right, it is Weedle. Now, Weedle is a bit more general, right? Weedle is actually based on the Wops or uh, Bee Lava itself. So you can see from the photo here, right? They don't really move around like people, right? They mainly just rest inside the cell, sleep, and be fed by the sisters, right? And how do they look like when you actually like, remove them out of the cell? They look like this, right? Almost very similar coloration to them. So this is how Weeder is being inspired for. But when Weeder evolves, it evolves to Kakuna. So how does the actual Kakuna uh, looks like? This is what you see, the Wops feel part itself. So you can see there's a lot of similarities between, you know, in terms of its posture, right? The positioning of the legs, right? Even the eyes. And then of course the final stage itself, we, most of you will know is Bijou. And Bijou is actually inspired by who? One particular species itself, and that is your, oops, sorry. Yeah, the Asian giant hornet, right? Now this species made news last year itself because it's actually being uh, discovered in the US, right? And some people actually call them the murder hornets, right? So you can see this coloration is actually very, very similar. Uh, yeah, it may not be exactly the uh, uh, Bijou, but you can call it Wops Jew, but there's some uh, other info. But you also see the coloration is similar, but even the eyes as well. Okay, now, but you know, when Bijou actually does his attack, so he always has points his stinger towards his target, right? So his abdomen will be actually being brought forward. So it's very similar. Right? When, even when warps are ready to sting, right, they will also aim the stinger towards the target. Right? Even when they are dead, right, once they start to dry up, so you start to see them curl into this popular posture. Right? So one local contact that we have here, right, there's something that's quite aggressive, right, is the greater banded hornet. Right? So this is actually one species that you see. So now, moving on, right, we are going to see another Pokemon that's green in color found in Kato region. Right? Uh, I'll give you a quick hint. This particular Pokemon itself has very sharp arms. Can you guess that Pokemon itself? Okay, right. Yes, that Pokemon itself is Scyther. Okay, now for Scyther itself, it's a Pokemon that is already based on one of the most popular and the charismatic insects, right? Even some of those insect enthusiasts will keep them as pets, right? Now, you can see in this particular photo, you see Scyther is almost as big as gold, right? In one of the latest animal, uh, in Pokemon anime series. So, which particular mantis? your giant Asian mantis itself, right? Coloration is the same, totally green, right? And you can see they have also two pairs of wings, right? Now, Scyther arms are sharp, right? Because for it's so you actually cut, but in reflection itself for your mantis, they have a for arms and they can be quite sharp. 
if you were actually mishandle them, right, by for my own experience, right, the spines on it can actually be quite painful when they actually jab you. Right? So basically, right, you see the arms are actually quite similar. Now, when it comes to sighted, you also there's another part that you may notice is that hey, the head here is there's like three horns, right? So, but when you look at most of the brain mantises, the head do not really have horns, right? Except maybe like the two antenna itself, right? So where do the spikes come from? Well, I would say that the spikes will likely be inspired by the horn mantises, right? For example, this flower mantis that you see over here. So there's a horn at the top of the head, and plus the antenna are actually very thick. It can kind of give the impression that there are actually three horns at it. So this is why it might be actually a reflection you see inside the Okay, now this is pretty much for cantal vision. I won't go through the, the rest of it. Let's go on to the next region itself. Okay, anyone recognize what region are we looking at here? <sighs> yes, correct. We are looking at Joto. Okay, so we are moving on to Joto itself. Okay. So in the Joto region itself, I think there are two Pokemon that are quite familiar, probably this one, Ladybug and Lydian. Right? So these are actually one of the common insects in the Pokemon world. Now, I think from the photo, you will also know that they are very, uh, they will be inspired by a certain particular species itself, right? your ladybirds or your ladybugs. Right? So for example, these are the two species that we have locally. In Ladybug itself, you also would know that its uh, biology is actually able to secrete aromatic fluid from the feet and the leg joints. Right? This is also a reflection to your uh, uh, beetles. Right? They can also secrete some very smelly juices from the leg joints. Right? So that is for your Lidiba and Lydian. Right? It's quite straightforward. But now let's go on to another two Pokemon in the same region. Right? And these two Pokemon, they have two pairs of wings. And they are regarded to be fast flyers, right? Um, in the insect world, we can actually regard them as fighter jets. Can you guess who they are? I, I give you a hint. Uh, dragon. Maybe that might give you a hint. So, yeah, correct. We are looking at Yanmai and Yanmega. Okay, so these two itself are also very similar. You can know which insects actually inspire them, right? So let's start look at uh, Yanmai first. Now, for Yanmai, Right, this is its original colors, but what is its shiny color itself? It is blue, right? Now, Yemma is actually based on the group of dragonflies, right? The family, this is the one that it's called, right? It's based on this group of dragonflies uh, in the insect world, right? And one local species that we have here is actually the blue marsh hawk dragonfly, right? Coloration is blue, it's quite similar, right? Even the wings or so is also a reflection on the stigma that you found on the tips of the wings. Right now, one last thing. Oops, hang on. Uh, is this part over here? You notice from the other insects that you see earlier, right? The eyes tend to be separate, right? There you can see two separate eyes. But when you see Yemma, its eyes is actually seems to be connected, right? So why is it so? If we look closely at the dragonfly, right? You see the compound eyes are actually connecting. I need to say touching each other. They almost look as if they are being connected to each other itself. So maybe that is why. When you see Yanma, it looks as if it has this little uh, goggles around its eyes, right? As if it's only one eye itself. Okay. Same thing goes for Yen, uh, Yamega, right? It's also based on another dragonfly itself. Now, looking at its body, right? Uh, for that previous group of dragonfly, it's much more small. So this one is based on the larger group, uh, on a group of dragonflies that are much more larger, right? This particular group here. And one species that we have that belongs to this group is your pale spotted emperor dragonfly. Okay, but although Yamega itself is very similar to this particular real life one, right? But Yamega is actually based on an uh, extinct dragonfly called the Mega Neural itself, right? This is actually why the name is actually contains the word Mega, right? So on the top right hand corner, you see it's actually the fossil, and the bottom right hand is actually the model that's based on it. Now, how large is this prehistoric dragonfly, right? That's something that you might ask. It's, it's said to live during the Carboniferous period. So it wingspan can go up to 70 cm. That is actually pretty much from the tip of your hand, uh, your fingers, all the way to your shoulders itself. That is actually how large the wingspan of this dragonfly. Okay, so Yen Mega and Yen Ma itself, right? I give you a good comparison of the two real life dragonflies that we have here. Okay, so this you can see how big the difference are between in terms of size. Now, 
let's go on to the next Pokemon itself. And this Pokemon is actually red in color, uh, has very red face, right? And it's a fighter, okay? Uh, it's an evolution of Scyther. Yes, <laughs> we are looking at Scyther itself, right? So yes, you, those who put in the chat group, you get to know the answer is correct. Right, now looking at Scyther, right? It's also similar to Scyther based on the Mantis. But we is actually based on one particular mantis itself called the boxer mantis, right? And we do have this particular species in Singapore here, right? And looking at its limbs, right, you can see the arms actually very similar, right? Both of them are actually very round, right? So why is it called a boxer mantis? For the mantis itself, you will actually see in real life, right? It tends to have that similar action as if it's trying to box somebody. That is why you earn the name of the boxer mantis. And also that is also why Sizer also has a move called bullet punch. Okay. At the same time, if you look at Sizer's arm, right, there's like spikes on the limbs of the boxer mantis, right? Same thing, there are sharp points on the Sizer's limbs, right? And this is actually a real life picture of your boxer mantis. Okay, right? So, right, so you can kind of see, you know, where Sizer actually gets this color from, right? There's some reddish hue on the boxer mantis, right? Or Sizer is based on the giant uh, Asian mantis cell, which we, okay, now. Next insect itself, or the next bug type Pokemon, right? It has a color that more or less the opposite end of the visible light spectrum. So that is blue in color. Okay. So and this Pokemon has a long horn, right? Uh, it always tends to go after Bulbasaur, right? To suck the set. <laughs> right. And yes, correct. It is actually Heracross. Right. Now Heracross is quite straightforward also, right? It's based on the Japanese final meter that you see over here, right? Uh, the horn is a, basically a dead giveaway to see the same NFTs. Now, and you also know that uh, rhino eaters, right, they do engage in fights with each other, especially between the males, right? So they use their horns to throw off the weaker meal, right? This is also why, you know, high cost is both a bug and a fighting type. Okay, but in the local town text, right, uh, we do have a rhino beater also, right? And you see some similarities. One of them is the horn, okay? Although it's actually much more, uh, smaller than the Japanese final beater. Right. And you also notice that in Hellcross, there are two things above his eyes. Right. This is actually the reflection of the MB's uh, beaters and pain. And for the arms, right, it's also very spiky, right? Similar to the limbs of your vinyl beater. And actually, believe me, if any of the vinyl beaters actually cross on your skin, right, and you were to try to yank it off, right, the beaters itself can sink in their spike and be very painful. Okay, now Hellcross has a mega evolution, right? And this is actually its mega evolution. This time it's not based on the uh, Japanese, Japanese vinyl beater. It's based on another beater, right? Your Hercules beater. So you can see the similarities is actually very, very much like, right? The, the horn itself, okay? At the same time, if we actually look at the back of uh, Mega uh, Heracross, but right, it's yellow. And that's also a reflection of your Hercules beater, which is Elytra is almost yellowish in color. Yeah, so you can see that as you go along, we again see a lot more of them are be quite similar to the real life insects. Okay, now let's go on to another region here. Anyone recognize this particular region? <laughs> right, correct, this is the whole end region itself, right? Now, when it comes to this particular region, any particular Pokemon that comes to mind, maybe um, two flying Pokemons, right? And these two flying Pokemons, they evolve from the same Pokemon. I think I do see one person has came up with the correct answer, right? Okay, so for the whole region, we are going to look at Dust Box and Beauty Fly. So let's look at Beauty Fly first. Right? Now, Beauty Fly, as his name suggests, okay, is actually a very beautiful Pokemon. Right? Now, Beauty Fly is, is very similar, right? It's based on a group of butterflies called Papillonidae as well. So the most of the design is actually coming from the old world swallowtail butterfly. Okay? Now, I would say it's a bit of a mix, right? Because you can see that for Beauty Fly, it has these two long extensions from its hind wings. So you're most probably coming from the other butterfly that's seen on your right hand screen. Now, you also notice that Beauty Fly has a coiled mouth part, but Butterfly has actually a pair of fangs, right? Now, the coiled mouth part itself is actually a reflection for all butterfly itself, right? They actually have the coiled proboscis, right? So this is actually, you can see the similarities for it as well. Now, for Beauty Fly, it's actually evolved from Wumpo. There's another Pokemon that also evolved from Wumpo itself, and that is Dust Dogs. Okay. Now, Dust Talk is a bit more simpler looking, definitely. Uh, is it in comparison to Beautifly, right? This is a base on the morph, especially the Japanese Luna Morph profile. 
right? The green coloration is a, also a giveaway. And you can see the general shape, right? It's actually quite similar. But if you bring it to the local context itself, right, in somewhere in this particular region, right? right I want to actually draw your attention to the shiny form of desktop. Right? Now you can see the shiny form of desktop itself as a yellow hue. Now we do have a morph that also is very similar looking. This ones. Right? These are actually one of the uh, like the lunar morphs itself. So you notice that in desktop itself, there are actually four markings. Okay. And right, that is actually very similar to the big markings in power queens. So unlike Beauty Fly, right, it has a pair of cloud antenna, desktop's antenna is actually much more thicker, right? It's a reflection of the morphs feathery antenna itself. So up to this point, you can see that some of these Pokemon are like a bit of a mix of different kind of uh, real life insects coming together as one. Well. Okay, now we are going to the next Pokemon. Now this Pokemon itself wants to be very swift, like a ninja. But the real life insect itself can actually be quite noisy, noisy during the daytime. Right? Can you guess that particular insect? You're right, correct. That we will be looking at Ninkada, Ninjas, and Shed Ninja. So, okay, uh, let's focus on the two on the left first, right? Look at that, uh, Ninkada and Ninjas, right? Now, Ninkada is a reflection of the Cicada needs, right? They spend most of the time uh, underground, right? Feeding on the set from the tree of the roots, right? Ninkada appears to have wings, but it cannot fly at all, right? This is a reflection that you see on the wing buds of your uh, Cicada needs itself, right? So, when it's time to evolve, this is actually what they do. Right? And you may have to metamorphosize for your cicada leaves, something like that. Right? So then you will move one last time, they will actually have to climb up the tree. So when you climb and then you will they move, you can see ninjas is actually very similar to your cicada, right? Yellow coloration and especially the big eyes. But eh, we talk about ninkada, we talk about ninjas. What about shed ninja itself? Mm. So this is your shed ninja, right? This one is based on the last move. Now uh, in some cases itself, right, or from what I have experienced, I've seen some people who've seen these uh, cicada modes, right? People are being very careful with the cicada modes, right? Because they think that it's actually still alive. But in fact, it's actually just an empty shell. Now, there's a reason why that people may not see it as being an empty shell, right? Because the cicada itself might be covered with lots of mud, especially if they will actually come out uh, just after the rain, right? So they also, from this itself, they may have actually inspired why they get Shed Ninja. Right? Now, for Shed Ninja itself, there is always a certain warning. Right? You know, you should never look into the hole that's found on the back of Shed Ninja. Because they say it actually can steal one speed. Right? That hole is actually a reflection of the full flesh allowed Cicada uh, once it emerges. Right? Basically, that you see over uh, the hole on Shed Ninja. And this is the, actually the opening of where the adult Cicada actually emerges from. Right? Right, the Cicada's mode, Shed Ninja actually has no internal organs. It's just pure emptiness inside. Okay, now we talk about the Cicada Pokemon itself, but I want to bring you guys back to the Kanto region. Right? But in Kanto region, there is also another Cicada Pokemon. Anyone knows? Right, this uh, particular Pokemon in the Kanto region actually has mushrooms on its back. Right, yes, correct. We're going to look at Paras and Paras itself, right? These guys are actually more or less should be the inspiration from your Cicada Pokemon, uh, from your Cicada. But uh, like, except that it's actually infected with a fungi because of the mushrooms on the spot. So let's just have a closer look at this uh, Pokemon, right? Now, this is actually the funder view of the two Pokemon itself, right? Now, in the museum, right, you, you actually visit our museum gallery, right, you will actually see this particular display. Right, the fungi were able to grow and produce spores. Right, but as it starts to grow, right, you will actually eat up the flesh of your cicada. Right, it eats up so much until there's nothing left, just the exoskeleton or the shell. So if you look at parasite, right, you will notice something very different compared to paras. Right, especially the eyes. You see, the eyes are just totally white out. But in paras, you see the eyes. You know that is you still can see the iris. So you know Parasite is still alive. But Parasite, you don't see the iris anymore. Already. So what does it mean? <laughs> right? Much like you see, you know, in like uh, horror films like the ghosty figures, right? The eyes are just totally white itself. Right? This is because Paras is already dead in it. And what's controlling the movements of Parasite is actually the fungi. Okay? 
So this is actually, let's see, yes, uh, very much similar to ants when they're infected by the fungi, like for example, cordyceps, right? So what happens? The fungi will actually uh, con mind control, right? It will actually tell the ant to move up to the highest point of the plant, right? So that you can, once you sprout this mushroom, you can actually spread the spores, right? So yeah, this is a bit of a, might be a bit of a disturbing fact in regards to parasite, okay? Right, so you can see the eyes for your parasite itself is totally white out, similar to the uh, eyes of the end, it's also totally white out as well. Okay, uh, right, I'm going to skip some regions, right? We're going to go straight into one particular region here. It has many islands, right? Very sunny, like Singapore itself. Yes, correct. We are going to look at Alola region. Okay, now in Alola region itself, hmm, which two Pokemon shall we look at this time? Right, we're going to look at QT Fly and uh, Rebombi. Right, see that uh, these two Pokemon are very small. Now, these Pokemon are actually inspired by your B flies, right? Scientifically, we call them from BD. Right, this is why they only have one pair of so, or uh, one pair of wings compared to like your Beauty Fly or your Dust Dogs, right? They have two pairs. But uh, in the image that you see here, right, don't be put by the two pairs of wings you see on QT Fly, right? This is just a screenshot of, of it flying in the anime. It only has one pair of wings. So which species actually inspired the creation to be like? This one that you see here. So you can see there's actually almost very, very similar itself, right? The beauty fly is very cute, right? But even the real life insect also, the bee fly is also very cute, okay? Now, but how about bee bomb bee, right? I would say in our local context, this particular um, bee fly itself could be the inspiration for your bee bomb bee, right? It's quite identical, right? Only one pair of wings. And also you can see that Ribombi you know, tends to have like a scarf around his neck, right? Very similar to the tough of hairs that you see around the neck of your bee fly, right? But for these two Pokemon, right, they are known to visit flowers for the nectar, right? Uh, the same can be said for the bee flies in the real world also, right? Like bees and butterflies, they also help in pollination whenever they visit the flowers for nectar, okay? But while the adult bee flies are actually herbivorous, I cannot say the same for what is for the young of the bee flies or the maggots. Do you know why? <coughs> right? So the larvae of your bee flies, are, they are actually predators, right? They are actually parasitoids, right? In particular, they are actually parasitoids of eggs. So when, you know, like for example, they would actually uh, find the grasshopper eggs, right? And then they will actually lay an egg beside it. Then the larvae will actually go in and start to eat it. But you also realize that you know, these eggs are actually fertilized and they have embryos. So in short, we can actually call them that these particular maggots of your bee flies are actually your, they are actually baby eaters, right? So cutie fly may be cute, but he has a very, very dark history. Okay, right? now I go to the next Pokemon itself, something that is uh, electric in nature in Alola. Can you guess which Pokemon is that? Yeah, we are looking at Vigavolt. Now, Vigavolt is also another uh, Pokemon that is actually quite straightforward, right? Its entire morphology is based on your stack vectors, right? For example, these two species that you see here, right? These two, you actually can see them in our museum here. Very similar, right? The jagged edges are very similar to the spikes that you see on your stack vectors mangroves. Now, Vigavolt is electric by nature as well, right? So the creator actually decided to incorporate the concept of the real gun. This one. Right, so in the real gun itself, you use the electromagnetic force in order to deliver a high speed projectile. Right, so this also explains why Vika Boat has a particular move called the Zap Cannon. Okay, now uh, I'm coming to the nearly to the end of it. Right, I'm going to my last bug Pokemon itself. Right, now this last bug Pokemon, right, is a particular uh, Pokemon that is actually inspired by uh, inset of my pictures. Okay, uh, I would say this particular insect is that most people actually dislike, right? Or in some cases, they actually hate this particular insect so much that they are ready to use flame thrower. I know some of you are in there itself are ready to use flame thrower on this particular insect, right? So which bug type Pokemon are we looking at in Alola, right? In fact, yes, correct. It is an Ultra Beast, and that is your Pheromosa, right? This is Pheromosa. Okay, yes, it looks very beautiful. Very elegant, right? Very uh, well to uh, well carried, right? But which particular insect inspired this creation of Pyromosa? This one, 
right? It's actually inspired by your cockroaches, right? But not just, uh, it, it can be any kind of cockroaches itself, right? Because there are some similarities that you see here, right? So cockroaches, eh? I thought cockroaches are always like tend to be like brown, dark brown, or even black, right? So where do these white cockroaches come from, right? What most of the cockroaches, once they moult, right, during that moulting stage itself, you will see them as white in color, right? They only last for a short while only before they return back to their brown or even black color. So pheromone mosa coloration is actually based on your uh, newly uh, moulted cockroach itself, right? So and theta is the same, right? You can see that pheromone mosa has like two long fringes, right? That is actually to show the antenna of your cockroach. Okay, and you see that uh for pheromone mosa's hair, right? It's actually very long and brown like shoe, right? It's actually your reflection of your head shield in your cockroaches. And even for the arms also, right? You see there are two arms, uh, or like say two claws, right? It's actually reflection of the tarsi for your uh the legs of your uh cockroaches, right? Yeah, so that is pretty much for me what I can show you and share with you with regards to like how different Pokemon uh, are being inspired by your real life process, right? So now I am uh, going to pass my time to Sean Yap, right? Uh, he actually studies the evolution of uh, dung beetles uh, in Singapore, okay? So uh, he's going to share some of his knowledge as well as uh, how the Pokemon actually really originated, okay? So uh, let me switch the screen to uh, Sean Yap. Okay, uh, Sean? Okay, hello. Can you hear me, right? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Sean. I am currently doing a PhD on the evolution of dung beetles in Singapore. So just quickly go through a brief, brief background of who I am. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess Marshall didn't really talk too much about what he does uh, in the museum and his research background, so I can cover that for both of us. Okay, so the work we do actually involves both uh, work in the field, in the forest, as well as work in the lab. So in the forest, we take on the role of bug catchers and we go around with nets, uh, not just nets, but we use a lot of different uh, trapping methods uh, to collect different, and study different types of insects. Uh, this is not me, this is a colleague of ours uh, named Sanka. So uh, we also work in the lab for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons is uh, because insects in, uh, in Singapore, right, they're very difficult to identify because no one has described uh, most of the species we have here. We can actually tell them apart by looking at their DNA. And so by analyzing their DNA in the lab, we can tell uh, which species are different from which very quickly. Yep. Uh, so my personal uh, group of interests are beetles. So uh, Moshan covered quite a few uh, beetles from Singapore in his slides already, but we actually have a lot of different species of beetles, uh, different sizes, different forms. Mm, many of them have not been described yet. So there are a lot of new species waiting for us out there. Yeah. So all of these were uh, species that were caught in Singapore. Uh, personally, I, when I play my Pokemon games, I generally choose to use only the bug types. So, so, so some of you in the chat, I saw that you doubted the strength of bug Pokemon and you're all wrong. <laughs> so uh, I've actually battled people who use a team of six fire types and I've won. So uh, bug Pokemon can be strong if you know how to use them, right? Yeah. And all of them are named after uh, actual genera of uh, real life insects. Yeah, flex. Okay, so because I study beetles, I'll go into a little bit more detail of, on one of the groups that uh, Marshall mentioned earlier. So this is a, uh, so Blitbug and Orb Beetle are Pokemon that were introduced in the latest generation. Uh, like Ladybug and Ladian, they are also based on Ladybirds, but they're based on the full life cycle of Ladybirds, right? So Ladybug is kind of like a baby version of Ladian, but in real life, uh, because they are beetles and they go through complete metamorphosis, uh, they actually have a larval stage that's a bit like a caterpillar, right? Uh, so you realize that their larval form actually looks very different from their adult. And because of this, uh, gardeners who are not aware of the life cycle of ladybirds actually end up accidentally killing them off. And why this is a bad thing is because uh, ladybirds are actually useful for the garden. They feed on aphids and scale insects and other pests that feed on, uh, on our plants, 
right? So they are a natural form of pest control. Uh, one thing that, uh, one misconception that people have about ladybirds also is that they are red with black spots. Uh, this isn't always true. They can be orange, yellow, can have no spots, uh, can have so many spots that they form a checkered pattern. Uh, so for example, in this species here on the bottom right, right, the one that you see uh, on the screen, this is the variable ladybird. It's a species that can be found in Singapore. And even within this species itself, uh, they can have different patterns. So you see the one that is completely black is actually the female and the one that is red on top of it is actually the male. Yeah. Uh, so they're not insects, but these are spiders and they're still bug type Pokemon. So we have a few uh, species here that look like the uh, spider Pokemon that we have in the game. In particular, Spinarak is actually kind of like a combination between a spider and a man face shield bug. But we actually have a species of spider in Singapore that kind of has a face on, uh, on his back. So this is very popular with macro photographers. So I say it looks like the Pringles man or the Monopoly man because it looks like it's a mustache. Um, and the St. Andrews cross spiders, the banded patterns on his back kind of looks like uh, Eridos. And for tarantulas in Singapore, we actually have at least three species. And the largest and the rarest of the three is the Singapore blue. So we have a Singapore brown, which is the smallest and the most common, a Singapore black, which is uh, the intermediate, and a Singapore blue, which is the largest and the rarest. Uh, so Singapore blue tarantula is found uh, only in Singapore and parts of Malaysia. And they are very, very rare in the wild. Uh, they are very popular in the pet trade and because of uh, poaching in the past, they are highly endangered species now. So they're actually more individuals kept in captivity, probably overseas by people who keep exotic pets than they are left in the wild. Uh, very difficult to find uh, nowadays. Yeah. So those of you who know the Pokemon Galvantula will know that it is a bug and electric type. So that is, okay, this is the size comparison. Uh, that's not my hand, that's some Ang Mo's hand. Plus, yeah, exotic pet. So Galvantula is bug and electric type. And uh, one interesting fact that uh, was actually recently discovered a few years ago, actually not a few years ago, 2013, <laughs> yeah, is uh, that some spiders they actually use static electricity to, so like let's say an insect flies close to a spider web, right? But it's lucky enough that it notices the web in time and then it tries to avoid the web. Sometimes there's a static cling on the web that pulls the web towards the insect. So even if you just avoid it, yeah, it can stick to the insects. Okay, so a few Pokemon from Unova, which weren't touched on. So uh, this, this, is, this one is actually my hand. Huh? <laughs> this is uh, Giant Centipede. This is from, actually this was from Pulau Tokong. Yeah. Uh, found this when I was in the army. Uh, it was already dead, so I didn't kill it. Uh, so these, the largest ones can get as large as a small person's forearm. Uh, they look very large and they look very scary, but rarely are their venom strong enough to kill an adult person. Uh, can kill us like a maybe three month old baby, uh, but not an adult. Okay, so there are actually a few Pokemon that are based on centipedes. One of them is uh, Centiscotch. So this one, the form of the Pokemon more closely matches an actual centipede. They are flat and they have one pair of legs per segment. So for millipedes themselves, they have two pairs of legs per segment. Yeah, that's how you tell the difference between a millipede and a centipede. Okay, so the interesting thing about centipedes, right, is they, we think they have a venomous bite. They are not actually biting you and they're injecting their venom. So these large uh, stabby things that you see on the underside of the head, these are actually a modified pair of uh, the first pair of legs, right? So they're actually legs that have uh, the venom gland inside and it's not part of the mouth structure at all. Yeah. So in this case, uh, the venomous centipede Pokemon would be Scolipede. So Scolipede, uh, the name comes from the genus Scolopendra. So Scolopendra is the name that's used for most of the giant centipedes that we know of. Yeah. Okay, so this is me from like 11 years ago with a moth that hatched from a pupa that I found in my parents' house. So this is the Atlas moth. It's the largest moth in the world uh, by wing area. So can anyone guess which Pokemon I'm gonna be talking about? Okay, so also you know her, right? So this is uh, Volcarona. Uh, Atlas moths, they're interesting for quite a number of reasons. 
uh, one is if you look at the wing patterns. So in uh, the Pokemon Volcarona, the spots on the wings are supposed to resemble the spots of the sun, because Volcarona is supposed to be a sun Pokemon. But in the case of the Atlas Moth, the spot at the edge of the wings, right, they're actually thought to be eye spots to resemble the side profile of a snake. So if you look at the wings, the edges of the wings, it looks like you're looking at a snake that's facing the side. Okay, and then uh, like butterflies and moths, they go through the uh, caterpillar, pupa, and adults. So here we have the caterpillar. So for Atlas moths, caterpillars, right, they eat a lot. All they do is eat, poop, and grow bigger, right? And because uh, they're one of the largest moths, their development time is longer than most other uh, butterflies and moths. And for that reason, it's probably why the Pokemon La Vesta that evolves into Volcarona actually evolves at one of the latest levels in the games. If I'm not wrong, it's like level 59. Yeah. Okay, so another group of moths, this one is from Sinnoh, which also wasn't covered. Uh, so these are the Pokemon Burmy, Wormadam, and Mothim. So the interesting about, uh, thing about this Pokemon line is that uh, Burmy, the Pokemon on the top right, the females evolve into Wormadam, while the males evolve into Mothim. So the males end up looking like a very, very moth-like looking insect, whereas the females, even after evolving, they still look like a uh, pupa, right? Or a larvae. So the other interesting thing about Burmy is also that it changes its form based on where it last battled. And uh, this is a reference to real life bagworms. So there are many different species of bagworms that use different types of materials to construct their protective coating. And this is usually used for camouflage as well as uh, to protect themselves physically from predators, right? Uh, the interesting thing about this group of moths is that in real life as well, a lot of species of bagworms, when they mature into adults, the females actually still look like larvae. Uh, whereas the, the males end up looking like moths. So these are some examples of male backworm moths. Uh, and what this phenomenon is known as is... Uh, okay, I forgot that exactly. <laughs> but it's the same thing that you see in uh, certain creatures like, uh, you know, Mudkip is based on axolotl. Yeah, so axolotls are also a type of animal that when they become adults, they still retain some of the traits that you see from their larval form, which is like their gills. Yeah. Uh, Neoteny is the word. Yeah. Okay, can anyone guess what these are? Pits in the sand. Anyone? Uh, sorry, can someone... How do I disable the drawing? <laughs> Hey, uh, Sean, it's at the top right hand corner, the three dot, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can press that and then you can disable annotate and remove the annotations. Try. The top bar. Okay, so um, I think some of you already saw uh, what this is. So this is uh, this is an ant lion larvae. It is uh, what inspired the Pokemon Trapinch. And uh, let me go on to show you what the uh, so like okay, so you saw the pits in the sand earlier. This is like a cross section diagram of what it looks like. Uh, so ant lions, what they do is they live at the bottom of these uh, sand pits, and they wait for ants to walk by, and then an unsuspecting ant that will fall into the ant, into the pitfall trap. Uh, the ant lion can actually sense the vibrations and then start throwing uh, bits of sand at the ant to try and cause like a small landslide. And then the ant will slowly fall towards the bottom of the pit where it gets trapped by the jaws of this uh, ant lion. And then the ant lion's jaws are both venomous and hollow. So it will paralyze the ant and then suck out its juices and then uh, pull it underground. Yeah. So the Pokemon Trapinch also evolves later into Flygon. So this is what the adult of the ant lion actually looks like. They kind of look like dragonflies, but um, they're actually not closely related to dragonflies at all. So trapinch, 
looks like this. And it evolves into Vibrava, which looks a bit more Dragonfly-like. And then finally, Flygon. So in the games themselves, they are not actually bug type. They are actually dragon and ground type. But their whole evolutionary line is based on the life cycle of this insect. Yeah. So Trap Inch, uh, the Pokemon on the top left, his uh, ability in the game is Arena Trap that prevents uh, opposing Pokemon from switching out. So this Arena Trap ability is a reference to the End Lion Spitball Trap. OK. So does anyone know what, uh, who this guy is, actually? Yeah. OK, this random uh, guy in glasses. Yes, OK. OK, I'm trying to remove the annotations, but can't seem to get that part of the controls. Yeah, I do think that some of you have already gotten the uh, correct answer to what Sean's uh, question is, right? Okay, so he's back. Okay. Um, so this is Satoshi Tajiri. He is the creator of uh, Pokemon. And so he used to, when he was a kid, he stayed in the rural part of Tokyo. And then he spent most of his free time in the countryside catching insects, trading them with his friends, uh, stuff like that. La. Basically what Mao Sheng and I do for fun. Yep, uh, so he was a bug catcher when he was a kid. And his uh, nickname back then was uh, Dr. Bug. Yeah, so all his friends would call him Dr. Bug because he was so knowledgeable. Uh, eventually he moved from rural Tokyo to the city uh, where the passion he had for catching bugs, he actually poured into video games instead. So for a period of time, he forgot about insects and he started playing a lot of games. And uh, he had a very high standard for video games and he felt that uh, back then, okay, he actually started this uh, fan magazine called Game Freak that he used to review games. And eventually he felt that most of the games that were out there were not up to par, so he wanted to create his own games. So the Game Freak magazine ended up becoming a company where he uh, basically wanted to design his own games. And so while he was designing his games, he was thinking about, you know, what will engage children. And he was thinking about his past uh, in rural Tokyo where he, and like the joy of discovery he had from discovering a new species of insect and like maybe trading with his friends as a species that he doesn't have. Uh, so this uh, childhood kind of sense of wonder, he thought he, he wanted to introduce to uh, the city kids. And while he was going through this uh, game creation process, he looked at the Game Boys. Back then, you actually had to physically link your machines in order to trade Pokemon. Uh, and what he did was he looked at the link cable and he thought of uh, insects crawling between the cables from one machine to another. And that became the whole basis for a collect collectible monster game with, uh, with two separate versions that don't have the same roster so that you could trade characters. Like if your friend has... Uh, red version and you have blue version and you have Pokemon that are exclusive to your games, and you can use a link cable to create uh, the Pokemon. Yeah. So aside from that, there were a lot of like real world influences in the design of the game. For example, if you look at the design of the Pokeball, it kind of looks like the uh, capsules, the Gachapon capsules that you get from collectible toys. Uh, to be honest, they are actually really useful when it comes to catching insects because they have a transparent uh, half that has also got like little air holes that can keep insects alive inside. So I can see why, you know, if you're a kid collecting insects outside, uh, this will be a useful tool. Yeah, so there are a lot of these little inspirations. So the whole concept of Pokemon and the idea of this massive franchise was kind of like born from a childhood obsession of this man with you know, collecting, finding new species and trading with his friends, which is quite interesting. Yep. Uh, I think I will pass the slides back. Okay, yeah. 
Okay, it's uh, 8.56. We have some time for questions and answers. The chat box kind of felt like a Pokemon conference, I think. Like everyone was just answering each other. So I don't know if anyone has additional questions to ask, but if you would like to, uh, please ask now. Are there endemic species of, of what in Singapore? Hi. I think he's actually referring to like the endemic species of uh, insects in Singapore. Uh -huh. Definitely, I would say there, there are insects that are actually endemic, right? Uh, but, but more research has need to be to confirm, you know, whether might they be present in the surrounding uh, countries, you know, like Malaysia, Indonesia, right? Uh, but definitely, we do have endemic species. Yeah. So, I think one example would be the recently described uh, species of firefly. So there's a firefly that was recently described. It's named the uh, Luciola singapura or singaporensis. And that one so far has only been found in Singapore. And based on DNA, it is very different from all the other species that are in like Malaysia, Thailand, everywhere else in Southeast Asia. So for now, as far as we know, it's endemic to Singapore. Insect collecting is unfortunately not allowed in Singapore without a permit. So mm. because we are researchers, we actually have to apply to the National Parks Board for a permit to go out and conduct our research. And without it, we're actually not allowed to go into the forest and catch insects. Yeah, I guess because Singapore is so small, it's not like Japan where they have like a sprawling, sprawling land and like lots of unmanaged forests, right? Um, if the insect flies into your house then, and nobody knows about it, then it's a gray area. Lah. What's your favorite Pokemon? Okay, personal question. So, Maushan, what's your favorite Pokemon? Uh, probably I don't really exactly have a favorite Pokemon itself. But if I would say favorite, definitely it will go for Mark types, right? So, even like Sean, I would have a team of uh, purely uh, Mark types. Uh, but if I were to put in the team, you know, I think it's quite similar to Sean also, right? I will put in like Vocarona. Uh, I think I also would put in like uh, Frostmoth, it's one of the latest uh, generation. Um, my personal favorite and sizer will also be another and become both yes. right now uh, just to name a few <laughs> you have a favorite sean mine my personal favorite is a bug type but it's not based on a uh, insect it's actually based on a uh, isopod so uh i think wimpod and gold isopod are those one so wimpod is the one that's based on uh what people usually call sea cockroach like if you go to the mm. breakwaters at east coast park or Pasir Ridge, you'll see them scuttling among the rocks right yeah Mm. So those are really cool to me. I mean, emergency exit is annoying, but uh, if you pair it with things like uh, red card or something, <laughs> there are ways to use it. Uh, this is a nice question. How can student scientists help the study of entomology in Singapore? It's a deep one. I'll show you the answer. <laughs> this one itself, I think... Uh... Yeah, there, there are actually different ways that you can actually help yourself. I think uh, recently... Uh, Sean and I, we also have, uh, you know, uh, together with some of the other entomologists, we started a Facebook group, right? So when people contribute, they actually contribute like the different photos, videos of uh, insects they found, right? Not just in the house, right? They also be found in their parks, uh, their nature reserve, or any place that they go to. So this one will become like a record for us to uh, know, like, you know, which are the more common insects, uh, which one might be more uh, rare. Uh, the other way you can also contribute or know to participate, you know, in this uh, research. Uh, the other one is the iNaturalist online. Right? Although that one is on a global scale, but we can also put it more locally, right? Find like the different insects where are they found. So very similar to the Facebook group. Uh, the other way is I guess maybe you know to keep a lookout for like uh some of the uh calls uh, looking for volunteers or people who want to help us in our research. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's one. People have theorized that Venonet looks visually more similar to Butterfree as compared to Venomoth. From an entomologist perspective, do you think this evolution line is possible? <laughs> okay. Uh, Sean, you want to go first or should I go first? Okay. So, just because things look similar doesn't mean that they are related, right? So one example would be like ants and termites. They look superficially similar but actually not closely related at all so in this case um butterfree actually in terms of appearance looks more like a butterfly venomoth actually looks like a moth and venonet is supposed to be based on a bagworm but 
doesn't really look like one or like a very fluffy caterpillar. So in most cases, right, uh, butterfly caterpillars usually do not have venomous spines, whereas moth caterpillars do. So usually the fluffy looking caterpillars that you see are moth caterpillars. Uh. So in that sense, aside from the compound eyes and like the nose design, uh, I would say that biologically, the, the way things are in Pokemon now match better. Let's see. What inspired you guys to venture into the world of bugs? Like, why bugs? Why insects? Besides the fact they are underdiscovered and you know little about them. Uh, maybe I can start off first. I, for me, I would say I actually first started uh, getting you know, to start playing with the river ends that is um, found uh, at the trees itself. Right. So you will find different kind of insects around. And then it is quite interesting in that you know you find I actually find more find more insects compared to like the other uh, animals like your birds or your mammals. Right? And each time I find it's, it's always quite exciting and quite curious, you know, as to what kind of uh, life do these insects actually lead up to. Right. So is it how they even metamorphosize and change from the larvae to an adult? Right? I find it that very fascinating. Uh, and then along the way, it's like, hey, you know, get to know that some insects are still understudied. So I study termites and cockroaches. And then I find, hey, you know, there's actually a lot of uh, different species of them are actually in Singapore itself, right? But some of them are also still, uh, you know, are waiting to be found. Yeah. That's for me. <laughs> How about you, Sean? Uh, actually, partly was Pokemon. Like the whole idea of. <laughs> Uh, collecting and uh, seeing new species on account thing kind of reinforced by Pokemon but uh, I think it started when I was a kid and then like uh, basically my kindergarten brought me out to a park and then gave us all each a jar and say like just catch whatever bring it back and <laughs> we can look at it right and so like uh, I was lucky enough to find like this huge green beetle and I brought it back and I was like the coolest bug compared to everybody else. And so like, I guess there was a sense of pride or something <laughs> that kind of stuck with me. And then after that, I went to read up on uh, the insect because I thought it was cool. And then from there, it just became a downward spiral. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, from here also, you can kind of see, you know, uh, Sean actually studies, uh, has a more, well, it's more interested or have a preference for readers. I for more, towards the cockroaches and termites. I think it was maybe Sean is how he first started out and first catch was a uh, beetle. So maybe that's why. Uh, for me, I guess it, from why I have the interest for cockroaches and termites itself was because I can remember my first pet was to be a cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> Approach. Okay. Actually, I think uh, Malcolm, we didn't in uh, you didn't introduce yourself at the start. Do you want to tell what exactly you do at the museum? Mm. Oh yes, true. So not just because I'm just an entomological creator in the museum itself, right? So I do have really conduct uh, studies, surveys across Singapore, right, in different places, right, surveying for the different kind of insects that we have in Singapore. So it's like going to it's kind of like you can see it's like a. Uh, like a Pokemon adventure, right? So I go to different regions or different areas in Singapore, right? Then from each of the different regions or uh, uh, different areas, I will try to find okay, what kind of insects do we have there? Whether is there some insects that are very common or some insects are actually uh, very new, right? So all of these will be, be uh, collected and then they'll be uh, put in the museum for, for research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, someone wants to know your cat's name, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not named after a Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I think uh, we've sort of come to the end of uh, today's session. It's already 9.05. Mm -hmm. If you have any other questions, again, feel free to write in to Maosheng or Sean Yap. You know, if you have their email. Or for Maosheng's email address, you can actually get it from the LKC NHM's website. So uh, moving on, uh, this is actually the first of the five, se uh, five sessions. Um, 
uh, for the Thursday talk shop series. So the next session is going to happen on the 26th of August and it's with one of our museum officers called um, Dr. Ang Yu Chen. So he's going to talk about flies. So it's another uh, group of insects and there's going to be session three, four and five as well. So if you'd like to sign up, uh, please look out for the links from our Facebook page as well. Okay, so um, moving on. Uh, just the last bit that I'm going to talk about uh, is that if you really want to support our research and education efforts, um, your gift will actually enable us to um, have a sustainable resource for the museum itself okay? and to shape our future if you're interested in biodiversity research, education and all the efforts that we do. So you can take time um, to actually sign the QR, um, scan the QR code and uh, make a donation if you'd like to. And before you guys leave, we would really appreciate if you could actually um, put in this feedback form. And I'm going to put this right in the chat box over here. So before you guys leave, please uh, fill in the feedback form. If you guys have any other topics that you would like us to uh, talk about, uh, you can suggest it and you'll see if we can talk about it for future sessions as well.